Last week in my video, I talked about the history of photography, so I thought now would be a really good time to talk about one of my all-time favorite photographers. This photographer got her start working as a model for Vogue, but eventually would end up being Vogue's war correspondent throughout World War II. This week we're talking about the photographer Lee Miller, and this woman has one of the most interesting lives I've ever read about in my life. Lee's father was an amateur photographer and was really interested in something called stereoscopic photography. This was photography that played with the illusion of depth within an image. He used Lee as the subject of many of his photos and also had an amateur darkroom, so Lee was able to learn some of the basics of photography while she was growing up. As a child, Lee was somewhat of a troublemaker in school and jumped from school to school quite often. For a couple of months as a teen, she found herself taking a course in Paris and absolutely fell in love with Paris and never wanted to leave. In 1926, her dad forced her to come home from Paris and she returned to New York where she started art school. The following year, 1927, she was walking around in Manhattan and she almost got hit by a truck. A man pulled her out of the way and this man ended up being Condé Nast. For those of you that don't know, Condé Nast was the owner of Vogue magazine and Vanity Fair and this was a totally chance meeting that just changed the course of her life. When they met on the street, Condé Nast just really liked her vibe and wanted to put her on the cover of Vogue, so that's what they did. A few short weeks after this incident and Lee Miller found herself illustrated on the March 1927 cover of Vogue. She continued to work for Vogue as a model after that and they eventually started to take actual photographs of her for the magazine as well. Through the late 1920s, she was on her way to being a model superstar, but then one of her photos was licensed for a Kotex ad. Because of this, she kind of got an association with menstrual products, so nobody really wanted to hire her to do any high fashion shooting anymore. By this point in her career, Lee was already kind of tired of modeling and really wanted to try being on the other side of the camera. So she wasn't really discouraged by the lack of work she was getting because she used it as an opportunity to change her career. One of the photographers that she posed for while working for Vogue, Edward Steichen, recommended that she seek out Man Ray if she wanted to learn about photography. Man Ray was a really prolific surrealist photographer and a lot of you probably know him from this work. So Lee Miller took Steichen's advice and headed to Paris to try to meet Man Ray. She started by going to his apartment but was turned away by the concierge and so she decided to try and look for him at a bar that she heard that he frequented and she happened to run into him while she was there. As the story goes, she went up to him and told him that she was his new pupil. He said, no, I don't take pupils and plus I'm going on vacation and she said, I know I'm going with you. And so that's essentially what happened. Lee Miller was successfully able to convince Man Ray to take her on as an assistant and during this time she started to work on a process called solarization. This was a photography process that she stumbled upon by accident when she accidentally turned the lights on while developing a photo. She discovered that by doing this, it reversed the black and white areas of the image and created this weird kind of halo effect. Lee Miller worked with Man Ray for three years, during which they also had a romantic relationship. Because of their close relationship, she ended up posing for a lot of Man Ray's photographs, and a lot of times, unfortunately, her career gets boiled down into just being Man Ray's muse because of this three-year period. And of course, as we are about to get into, her career is much, much more than just that. In 1932, her relationship with Man Ray ended and she moved back to New York to open her own photography studio. During this time in the United States, the Great Depression was going on, so it was pretty difficult to secure commercial work. So sometimes things were a little bit slow, but ultimately Lee was pretty successful. In 1934, she unexpectedly married an Egyptian railroad magnate by the name of Aziz Elouai Bey. Following their marriage, she moved to Cairo and lived there for several years. While living in Egypt, Lee continued to develop her photography and took a lot of pictures of the desert while she was there. After a short while, Lee was really tired of living in Egypt and really missed Paris and wanted to go back. So in 1937, Aziz bought her a plane ticket to Paris and she went back to Paris by herself. 
just after her arrival in Paris, she attended a party where she met the surrealist painter Roland Penrose. The two fell in love and in 1939 she left Aziz and followed Roland to London. In 1939, World War II begins, and also during this time, Lee Miller goes to British Vogue and tries to get a job for them and is turned down. However, a year later, so many of their male photographers have left to serve in the war that they actually ended up needing her after all. When Lee started working for Vogue, she started working for them as a fashion photographer, but because of the war, London was getting absolutely destroyed at this time. Several challenges like various bombings and power outages sometimes forced Lee to have to take photos on location. A lot of the photographs coming out of this era of her work feature glamorous women juxtaposed against the absolute destruction of London in the background. As the war progressed, Lee was getting a little bit frustrated because working as a fashion photographer just felt a little bit frivolous to her while there was war going on. She was really itching to aid in the war effort in any way that she could because she had a lot of really good friends living in Paris who were suffering under Nazi rule at this time. Eventually, when the United States joined World War II, Lee Miller got her chance to get a little bit closer to the action. While Lee was living in London, she was still an American, so when the United States entered World War II, she was able to become an official war correspondent for the U.S. Army. In July of 1944, she arrived in Normandy for her first assignment. At this point in history, traditional gender roles were still really heavily enforced, so women were absolutely not allowed anywhere near the front lines or anywhere near combat. Instead, they sent her to field hospitals to document the goings-on there. In August, they sent Lee to St. Malo's, which was supposed to be a pacified zone, but due to some military miscommunication, ended up being active combat. Lee had accidentally landed herself right on the front line, and she stayed for pretty much the whole time and took photos. Later that month, Allied forces started to make their way through northwest France, and Lee Miller found herself in Paris just in time for the liberation. She did not stay for very long, and in early 1945 began to follow Allied forces into Germany. While she was there, she famously documented the Buchenwald and Dachau concentration camps. These death camp photos were printed in the June 1945 issue of American Vogue with the headline that just said, Believe It. Up until this point, there was not a lot of photo coverage of what was actually going on in the concentration camps, and it was really easy for people to write off things that were written as just war propaganda. When these photos were published in Vogue, this was really the first time that people around the country saw what we were fighting for during World War II. On April 30th, 1945, Lee Miller leaves Dachau and goes with Life Magazine's photographer David Sherman to Hitler's apartment. While they were there, they both took photos in Hitler's bathtub. This photo is really powerful because we see Hitler's pristine bath mats being muddied by boots that were just walking around the Dachau concentration camp not hours before. This photo was also taken on the very day that Hitler committed suicide, so that adds a lot to its meaning as well. After the war, Lee Miller continued to work for Vogue through the early 50s before retiring. Lee really struggled to adjust to life after the war because she was struggling pretty heavily with post-traumatic stress disorder. At this point in history, we did not know anything about PTSD. There was no real treatment options or any help that anyone could get, so it was a really difficult time for her. Lots of the photos that she took during the war ended up sealed up in her attic, and even her own family didn't really know the scope of everything that she had seen during her time working as a war correspondent. She died in 1977 and at that time her son found all of these old photographs in her attic and there were over 60,000 of them. For a long time Lee Miller was known as a muse only and not taken seriously as an artist in her own right. Because of the discovery of all of these photos and the work that her son has done with the archive, she is finally starting to get some of that recognition that she deserves. If you made it to the end of the video, thank you so much for watching. I'm going to link some resources at prettiestpair.com and I will see you next week with a new video. See you soon!